as I'm sure you've all seen before, is that the end was... Since the 17th century, the prevailing way of interpreting the natural world has been that of orthodox science. I stop that. We have got, in essence, if I do it with two, we have got... Newton's vision, refined and developed by 19th and 20th century physics, views the world as a system governed by implacable natural laws, accessible through the operations of logic and reason. Newton's cradle. Simple example of the idea of the third law of motion. So if we were to try and... Generations of school children have learnt the fundamental approach of orthodox science to natural phenomena. Hypothesis, verified and refined through the collection of data by experiment, leading ultimately to proof. Science looks at the natural world because that's its job. And of course it will be looking at objects and phenomena which parascientists are also interested in. I think the difference is in the logical approach which scientists take. If there is a phenomenon, like your corn circles, like dowsing or something, the scientists will say, well now, does this in any way fit in with a pattern of what we know uh, and understand? The former hypothesis, could it be such and such a thing? What tests have we to make? And are there any sort of null tests on, on, on other manifestations? So it tries to take a logical approach to things. Try this, does it work? Try that, does it work? And th this is a natural, logical way of going about things. But there's another approach to understanding natural phenomena. Although its roots go back to before Newtonian science, it's primarily a reaction against the domination of a mechanistic approach. Now, most people these days consider parascience to be things like parapsychology, astrology, graphology, palmistry, all of those studies which are outside of the accepted norms of the establishment academic view of science. So what we're talking about really are people who study things that don't fit in with the classical Newtonian reductionist, mechanistic view that the Western world has held for the last 300 years. I think we're all interested in mystery. We all prefer to think that there are mysteries out there that, that science can't boil down to boring equations. And in some ways, I think this has grown in the past 20 or 30 years. And in, in many ways, I date it to the 60s, to, to the beginning of the realization that experts, that scientists, had somehow got something a bit wrong. And that something was largely, I reckon, nuclear power. That the reassurances and the promises given about nuclear power um, turned out in a way to be wrong. And it was from that that a sort of doubt about the expert, about whether to believe him or not, has been creeping in more and more. What's very common in episodes of this kind uh, is that the different parties involved are very keen to appropriate the phenomena for themselves over which they're arguing. Uh, they want to define, to colonize the phenomena for their own purposes. Now in situations where the stakes are very high, where this involves uh, a battle for turf, it can be very important to knock out the other side uh, completely. This may account for the particular virulence of a particular episode, a particular controversy over a new kind of phenomenon. The worldview that we were brought in, up in basically said we know everything there is. It's a clockwork universe. We can explain it all. We can predict it all. There's no mystery left. And crop circles have been a very public, very obvious mystery. There's a lot of magic around them. And people love mystery and magic. The public understanding of science is very important. And maybe things like this, phenomena like the crop circles, are a very good way for scientists to get into the business of public understanding of science. The, the trouble is that you find yourself in what you might call very mixed company. And it, it's all very well on, on a program like this, discussing 
fairly seriously what's, what's happening, but you do find yourself amongst people who use terms very loosely, you know, energy and ley lines and all this sort of rubbish, and the discussion becomes very, very difficult because they are convinced of a deep psychic significance in these things, and they're unbudgeable. And the, the, the conversations with people like that, who, who are emotionally involved, I may say, uh, become really rather pointless. So there's a balance, again, that you have to strike. You have to say, I would like to enter into a serious discussion, and we will use the corn circles as a, an example of the scientific method. On the other hand, if you find yourself in a kind of a, a seance with people who are completely hooked on the unknown, uh, then uh, it's a fairly profitless business. Scientists have vied with para-scientists in analysing the complex patterns of corn within the circles and their remarkable sharp-edged symmetry. No blade of corn has remained unexamined in each side's attempt to produce a universally accepted explanation compatible with their own particular world view. For many adherents of parascience, the basis of an explanation starts with the circle's geographical location. In the 1960s, Neolithic monuments like Silbury Hill came to be seen as embodiments of mystical power. Hippies flocked to the sites dotted throughout Wiltshire. And their belief that powerful but inexplicable spiritual energies flow from such sites has since taken root in a wider community. Dousing an ancient craft, still used by many farmers to locate sources of water, has become a popular way of trying to locate spiritual energies. The traditional hazelwood twig has been replaced by metal rods. Dousers believe they'll cross over or open out when held over sources of water or energy. When I talk about energy, um, I don't mean it in the sense of um, raw electricity or something like that, which can be picked up on a meter. Um, I'm looking at it from the point of view that we are like a battery, and our hands show a plus and minus in effect. Or, and we are picking up that energy, which we believe to be a, um, electromagnetic or electrostatic. And to many dousers, the mysterious crop circles are potent sources of such energy. I'm now walking into the energy field here, and as we come into the energy field, the rods automatically open, like that. Now, you may feel that, having all watched the Paul Daniels show, that this is a very easy bit of magic to detect. So I'm going to show you that uh, it isn't an involuntary reflex of my hands. I've got here two holders made out of barrows, and in this way, I shan't actually be touching the rods at all as I come in. And I step gently back again out of the energy field. Um, there's a bit of a, a, a wobble on them, obviously because of the wind. But uh, if we walk gently into the energy field here like that, you'll see that exactly the same thing, in fact, happens. So that um, dousing is a reality. It works. Many dousers believe that the energy coming off crop circles flows from invisible lines of energy known as ley lines, which crisscross the globe linking spiritual centers. They find crop circles to be in alignment with the ley lines, and they believe there's some causal connection between the two. Ley lines are believed to be some uh, form of energy. In this context, I believe them to be lines of uh, geomagnetic force linked to the Earth's magnetic field. Um, it's believed that um, some of the standing stones actually um, act as receptors, if you like, to this energy, and that people um, in our uh, ancient ancestors, Neolithic past, and perhaps people who have certain psychic gifts who are able to uh, use this area to actually enhance their psychic abilities. <laughs>